Hey guys, welcome back to the Preview Alliance podcast. It's Sarah here. Today we got a very special guest, Miss um, Joyce Butler. She is a nurse and health coach and all thing guru of how to make your insurance, this medical world resources work for you. And we're so excited to have her and welcome Joyce. Thank you, Sarah. It's so great to be with you today. I really appreciate um, this, this time for us to have a discussion about the, the support that uh, moms need in their journey uh, through pregnancy and postpartum. So, so true. Okay, let's start off by giving our listeners a rundown about who you are, what you do, what kind of brought you here. Oh, wow. Wow. Uh, well, as you said before, I, I've been a nurse um, for now over 37 years, right. and uh, I'm currently um, the the training um, the training manager for an organization to really teach them teach the the staff that work with, with us um, MHN um, teach the staff of an ACO. Um, how to care for the patients that they serve. Um, so I'm responsible for the training and orientation as the, the senior manager. And um, we really have a great time helping them to not only remember uh, why they came into you know, the healthcare, but how to work with patients and teach them the self-management uh, uh, skills that they need um, to be able to navigate the system uh, that we have here in our country, even in their local setting, and how to advocate for themselves. Um, and so it is training the trainer is what we consider our, our program to be uh, as we train um, um, unlicensed as well as licensed healthcare providers um, to be in this space. Love that. And you said advocate for yourself. And that is something we're very big on here at Preview Alliance is for teaching our moms to speak up. And in your experience, do you see, especially during pregnancy and postpartum, that moms struggle, you know, to navigate this and to say, you know what, this is not right, or I can't find this, I need help. Yes, I have seen that over the years. Um, I know early in my career, I worked in labor and delivery. Then I worked in the community as a, a, a public health nurse for the city. And there were uh, a lot of struggles, uh, them not knowing where to go and even how to pre present themselves when they arrived at whatever healthcare facility they uh, chose. And so it was just teaching them, you know, the basics of the system, as well as how to speak up for themselves and say what they needed. Um, yeah. You know, historically women are, you know, kind of put in this place of you should be seen and not heard. Mm -hmm. And so when you need to say that there is something not right, or you want to know what should be going right in your life, in, in your health care, you have been really programmed not to have that voice. Yeah. And so coming through nursing school and learning how to even have my own voice, yeah. Uh, I, I learned how to, you know, provide that skill set or that transference to to patients and specifically women um, where, you know, sometimes they don't get the benefit of being uh, raised up in, in a situation where they can uh, take care of themselves or know how to take care of themselves. And, and this, for me, I've seen cut across all ethnicities. Um, yeah. Um, especially when, you know, we're in this pandemic of, you know, COVID and just basic things like wash your hands as often as you need, you, you can, when yeah. you think about it, um, being able um, to uh, be in uh, germ-free air, you know, yeah. uh, and, and those kind of things, what people take for granted are really essential for survival. Yeah. 
They're and so, so true. When, yeah. And so when we're talking about the, the women, uh, specifically those who are brown, black and brown, um, them having to go into a system that doesn't welcome them in the first place because of the society that we live in on this planet and in this, in this nation, um, they're, they're afraid. Oftentimes yeah. healthcare um, looks at them as, um, why don't you want to do these things? It is not that they don't want to do them. They are yeah. afraid to do them in that space yeah, because of the way society has treated them. And so they're not only protecting them, but they are also protecting this gift that they have within them, their, their baby. Yeah. And so they're apprehensive. Um, I've heard stories of women who have had really bad outcomes and interactions with, with providers. And so, you know, even before they got pregnant and sometimes some who had previous pregnancies. And so now it's time to go back into this arena again. And I had a bad outcome before or a bad encounter how am I going to protect myself and my baby? And what do I, how do I do that? And yeah. so there are many things that they can do. Um, you know, now that we're in this technology age, look things up, understand what you need to say and do before you get to a particular stage in, in your healthcare journey. Um, know that you can ask questions. You can um, uh, say how you feel. Yeah. Um, you can, you know, tell people about their bedside manner, that it's just not, it's not your love language. You're yeah. not receiving what you need to receive. And can we do this differently? Um, yes. You know, I, I'm a, a master certified coach. And one of the things in my training was that uh, we learned about appreciative communication say what is not working and say what you need it to be for you to be able to partner with this person and, and walk through. And I'm, you know, probably butchering that whole, you know, no, no. It. Mm -mm. but it is not being so defensive or offensive that you don't take the time to teach someone else who you are and what you're capable of doing and what you're willing to do in partnership with them. And, and find that. that that, that uh, medium ground where you could both work. Sometimes providers, because of their, the, 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 the pressure of uh, being responsible for another person's life makes you feel hurried, makes you feel like you really need to get to the problem. Let's cut to the chase. And oftentimes, what we see as poor bedside manner is just them wanting to make sure they get it right for you. And, and so interpersonal skills may or may not be there. Absolutely. And so we as, as um, patients from that perspective, just need to have a conversation with our provider. Some of the things that, you know, women can do prior to, you know, having a baby is go visit the, the, uh, the healthcare facility that you're planning to partner with. Cause this is a partnership, you know, you're, you're giving access to your life and you're yeah. allowing those professionals to give you some direction and guide you into some, you know, informed decisions. And so go see what it's like, um, get a chance to talk to someone, you know, uh, make a visit, have that intro or uh, initial uh, visit with a provider, ask about the services there mm -hmm. and see if that is the atmosphere that you can work with. Um, have an appointment with the ob gyne provider, have a gyne visit, and then talk to them about them being your provider for, for your you know, prenatal and postpartum care. Yeah. You, get, you get a sense of of how they operate, they get a sense of who you are and you are building this relationship. And as you continue to partner with that provider, if that's what they choose to do, then you're gonna be able 
to uh, understand some do's and don'ts about each other as they teach you the system. You know, one of the things that I have had to do in, in my life, because I'm a nurse, I usually don't even tell anybody I'm a nurse. And I don't if either. They tell, if they tell, if they find out, I say, I want you to treat me like a patient. Because now I'm looking for you to guide me and to give me information. And yes, I have knowledge uh, that, you know, will either align with what you're saying or you will enlighten me on something that I wasn't aware of. No, you're so right. Yeah, don't default to, you should already know about this. Approach me as a learner because I am going to approach you as a teacher, a coach. How that, can you speak to if you have tried with this provider and it's not happening, it's not meshing, you guys are not meaning that you can ask for another opinion. You can seek other healthcare, you do not have to stay in a, like you said, a relationship that is not going to make you feel heard or seen or safe. Yeah. And, and, and it's good to even say to that provider respectfully, we're, we're not connecting. You're not communicating with me and I'm not hearing you. And I've made multiple attempts. This is my last attempt to see if we can have some common ground, but understand I need to move on to find someone that will listen to me and will hear me. It is nothing wrong with that. We already have that skill set built into us. We have friends that we grew apart for one reason or another. And we have, you know, we've had some relationships that we might have had a, uh, made a decision to say, this is not a good relationship for me, me any longer for these reasons. Yeah. And so it's okay to have that because, you know, in, in healthcare in, in, uh, in the United States is such that we are evaluating ourselves. We want to know whether we are satisfying to our, our customers, our patients. And so we do satisfaction surveys. We want to know those things because we want to improve. I can tell you over the 37 years, I've seen some improvement and even Mm -hmm. communication, you know, how we treat each other in the healthcare system, as well as how we treat our patients and how we educate patients to understand the system and how the patients treat us. And so it is so, so important for us to be able to be transparent and communicate, get rid of the implicit bias or the unconscious bias about a particular culture, Mm -hmm. specifically women, culture of women, you know, culture of, you know, an ethnicity. Let's get away from those assumptions and get to know the individual. Right. And learn from that relationship so that you can take it to the next patient that you take care of. Yeah. And then you find yourself with a body of knowledge that you have uh, experienced and, oh, wow, women really do want this for themselves. They just didn't understand our procedure. They didn't understand our language because healthcare language is it, it is just that it's a yes. it's a separate language, and so I as think we, yeah, people yeah. just don't want to ask. They're they're like, oh, I think I'm going to sound, you know, stupid if and I hate that word, but you know, if I ask, what does this mean? I'm supposed to know what this means. I mean, there's I know there's stuff still as a nurse that I'm like, let me double check that because that's been years ago before I, you know, I heard that. I'm sure you do the same thing. We still have to constantly re-educate ourselves. Absolutely. That's one of the reasons why, you know, when uh, 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 there were, I, I want to say about 20, 25 years ago, they asked us to stop abbreviating things because what I used as abbreviation, I thought had this meaning and what you use the same abbreviation for was a totally different meaning and so they said say what you mean 
stop abbreviating. And I believe that's what we tend to do in our perception of others. We stick with that initial abbreviation, whether it was passed down from our parents, our family members, you know, our educators, and we said, this is how it's going to be for the rest of our days here, living together. And so we have to be open to different definitions from different cultures and different mm -hmm. ethnicities. What does time um, mean to you? Yeah, some ethnicities, they say, when I'm done with everything in the morning, I can come to an afternoon appointment. But in healthcare, we say, you want an afternoon appointment? We're going to give you 1230. Yeah. We expect that you come to the 1230 appointment 15 minutes before. But in some cultures, nothing starts in the afternoon until the morning activities have been completed. And so helping us to understand each other and not just put each other in a box and say, you don't fit, but I'm going to treat you this way anyway, mm -hmm. is not working. No, it's not. It, it's, it's resulting in outcomes that neither side wants to see. Women don't want to die from pregnancy and postpartum events. No. No. And healthcare providers don't want to be labeled as this is a patient that I took care of. Something went wrong. Yeah. And so we have to be able to communicate. But with, from the woman's perspective, they have to be comfortable saying how they feel. And if you can't express yourself in your family or you don't have a friend that you can express yourself with, you have to find a way to be able to, to feel comfortable. I think, you know, if we all default to going out to a restaurant, you tell them exactly what you want to eat. Yeah. And you become comfortable with that. And as you enter into the healthcare arena, you're telling the person that's making your appointment when you're available. You're telling the person that's checking you in for the appointment. The assessments that they're using, they're actually asking you how you're feeling. What mm -hmm. is going on with you? Feel comfortable in that. So that when you get to the provider, you have practiced on how many people since you walked through the door yeah and you can tell them this is what I need this is what I want do they have a structured visit absolutely but you have to be able to have that presence to say this is what I need I've had this experience in the past I don't want to have that again tell me how you handle these things I love that. You know, so many moms, like you said, mistrust, miscarriages, losses, infertility, you know, the, the birth experience was not what they wanted. Postpartum depression, anxiety, PTSD from the events that happened during pregnancy, all that we, we still hold with us. And I say that as we, cause I've experienced that and it, you do bring it into the next and to have a relationship with a provider where you can be open and honest is invaluable. But you, like you said, it's a relationship. You just like with our family and our spouses or partners or siblings, you got to work at it. And I think that's a very valuable point is people sometimes just think, oh, here's this doctor, you know, I have to do exactly what they say. I just just sit there and be quiet. And that's super isolating. And that's not what women need. Like you said, right. we can be very much seen. We can be very much heard these days. Yeah. And it's our rights. And they, we're carrying these babies. One thing I also really want you to talk about is how, so say this mom, new mom, new insurance situation. And they're like, I don't know what my insurance can do for me, or I don't know what my, I don't know anything about my benefits. Maybe their parents always kind of handle it. Maybe it was a previous relationship where that spouse handled it. Now they're out on their own and they're trying to, let's be honest, insurance ain't going to try to help anybody. We got to 
help ourselves to have insurance do things. What can you help them kind of just give them some tips, give them some tips, because I know you got those, you've got those Joyce insights here that they need to know about. Well, one of the first things that I ask patients when I'm encountering them uh, and we're trying to figure out what um, what their needs are and where they can get those needs met is that I, I pretty much know that they have a particular insurance. And so I say, did you ever receive your insurance packet? They'll probably say, I threw it away. That thing and- that was like 100 pages. Or they don't remember it or something. Mm-hmm. And I say, well, that was the introduction to your uh, your health insurance. And it's it's no, uh, it's not a negative charge against them. You know, we tend to, uh, we kind of normalize categorizing our mail, junk mail versus important to me. <clears throat> and so helping them to understand that this is important to you. You signed up for this for assistance. And so here's your packet. And so even if they don't have the packet anymore or they didn't read it, I say, you know, your health plan has a website. And so you have access to the internet. If you don't have access to the internet, you can go to the library, uh, take out a library card and you can use their, their computers, their internet, and you can Google that insurance company. And if they have their insurance card, they can call the 1-800 number, which is usually member services. And that's exactly what it is. It is a a telephonic service for that member to call and ask questions and get directions. And they'll send them things in the mail. Uh, In addition to uh, just getting that contact information either from their insurance card or from uh, the website, there is a section on the website labeled members. Mm. It talks about all their benefits uh, and and it's usually in another language, um, uh, usually Spanish or or Polish or some some other language, maybe specific to that particular area they live in the United States. And they can go on and they can see all of those things that are available to them. And they can get on, you know, afterwards looking at it, whatever they didn't understand, they can call member services and say, can you explain this part of my benefit? What does this mean to me? How do I access this information? And they should get some assistance with understanding their benefits. Um, uh, Some um, health plans also have what's considered a rewards program, an incentive for patients, members of that health plan to uh, access certain benefits um, that are might be time sensitive. Um, and when they do that, they get a reward, usually in a rewards card that is similar to a credit card. It gets loaded with money where they can go and access more essentials Um, that they would need for their health care, like, you know, vitamins and, you know, diapers for babies and things like that. And a lot of times people don't know that because they've not been told or they didn't know that they can seek after that kind of information. And so it's very important to become familiar with your health plan, call member services. It doesn't matter if you call them every hour they will be there yeah, because that's what they're there for to answer your questions and to help you to navigate their health plan. They also have for certain portions of the population, a care management program. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the programs, the the, the, uh, uh, program that I teach for the ACO for you know, uh, for our um, for our state, and so understanding all of that information and where to get it, that goes back to being comfortable and saying how you feel and what you need, and not being ashamed to say I don't understand that word, 
we've learned in healthcare about health literacy and that oftentimes we get caught up in our own language in healthcare and we just make assumptions because people sit there and shake their head. Yes, I understand, but they really don't understand. Yeah. And there have been a lot of research about health literacy. It didn't matter who you were, how educated you were. If you didn't understand our term, you assumed that it was something of, 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 of minor value or something that was major when it really wasn't. Mm -hmm. And so it's okay to say, what does that mean? Yeah. How is that going to affect me? What body part are you talking about? What will it do to me as I grow older? What will it do to my baby? That's, those are valid questions because yeah. it, now we, we are looking for informed consent, informed decisions. And the only way a patient should make a decision is if they have been fully informed, not conveniently informed, fully informed for them to understand if I do A, this is what's going to happen. If I do B, this is what's going to happen. What's best for me? And even if A or B does not fit, is there a C? Yes. And there often is a C and people think, and but you got to keep pushing that because some providers still are stuck in the AB mentality. And that's, you got to, you got to push them to say, that's not going to work for me. We need that C. We might need D. Yeah. Yeah. And that's okay. And, and that's you know how that. we, yeah, that's how we evolve in healthcare. Yeah. No, I love we, that. I, you know, I think too, and this is very important for once we have the baby, right? You have this baby, they're going to have to go to the doctor. Babies, you know, just throughout their routine checkups and then they get sick and navigating our insurance. It's a formula shortage. It's a diaper shortage. How these moms, you got any tips? Because we don't know what next year is going to look like with our shortages. Do you have any tips for moms who are like, how am I going to find formula? How am I going to find diapers? How can they think outside this box of what we've been told that you only have X way to find formula or, you know, this is the only way to get diapers. What's some tips and tricks there? Yeah. Um, one of the, the tricks is natural breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. And I know that makes some people feel like, are you kidding me? Yeah. You know, yeah, I, I'm not kidding you. Um, breastfeeding. And then, you know, there is the argument of, I have to go to work. Yeah. You know, women hundreds of years ago, they had to go to work too. Mm -hmm. And they made arrangements and they made allowances in their lives to take care of this new life in them. And it, it's a decision that you have to make. What is going to fit for you? And what is now going to fit for you and your baby? And most health plans provide uh, for moms to get a breast pump, but there is um, uh, an interval that most people don't think about. You know, I, I'm thinking about uh, one of the health plans that um, the the formula, I mean, the uh, breast pump is only uh, renewed. That that access to that new breast pump is only renewed every five years, and so some women think, oh. I'm not going to have another baby, so I don't need it anymore. I tell women all the time, hold on, because anything could happen. And after that five-year mark, okay, but hold on to it. Because the health plan is, is there for multiple people. And so they have to be good stewards of, of the, their assets and say, we can't give everyone a, a, a breast pump every single year, but it is going to last for at least five years. So we'll renew that benefit in five years. And um, the other thing is when we're looking at the supply chain, we have to be creative in the resources that we are seeking after. When you're thinking about diapers, 
uh, we used to have cloth diapers, reusable diapers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's something that you might have to invest in if your health plan has a rewards program, you get enough on your rewards where you can purchase those reusable diapers because you're purchasing detergent whenever, you know, frequently to clean your clothes. Of course, you want to get the detergent that's uh, uh, um, delicate to the skin and you want to wash those diapers separately from the general household um, Mm -hmm. because of the sensitivity of newborn babies. But those are creative ways that you can think outside the box, especially since we have become a a nation that is dependent on others for our livelihood. And and what I mean is, you know, we go to the grocery for the farmer to bring the meat and the vegetables and the fruits to a distribution center, our grocery store. Mm -hmm. And are we capable of growing fruits and vegetables? Yeah, it's it's a paradigm shift that yeah. we have been forced into. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, some people have already been doing that, but now we have to make the paradigm shift when it comes to moms and babies and say, what can we do to be a part of uh, this health walk that we're on that doesn't have any gaps. What what can we do to fill in the gaps? There are uh, WIC programs, women, women, infant and children programs throughout the country that they can be, become a part of. Um, that's forming relationships uh, with dietitians and 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 professionals uh, about nutrition that can give you even more tips on formula when there's yeah. a deficit um, and, and, and nutritional things that you can do for you and your family moving forward that help to separate you from that uh, dependency on someone else presenting your livelihood to you. Yeah, no, I love that. I, I think you've, you've hit on such great topics and it's these moms, these listeners need to know that to recap, I love the fact that it's an education relationship. It's a partnership. We don't have to feel isolated. We don't feel like we can't speak up. It's our right. It's our job to speak up. And especially the, you don't tell them they're, you're a nurse. I don't either. Cause I don't want to be a nurse in that moment. I right. want to be the patient. And I say that to moms, like you want to, you know, when you go and you bring your sick baby, you're the mom, you're not the doctor trying to figure it out, right? You present the concerns. Same thing with our mental health, you Mm -hmm. know? We don't have to figure it out. What we try to do with our moms is screen early, provide education, what's normal, what's not normal. And then they present it to the doctor, right? Or they present it to the therapist. But, and using your resources, use your benefits, use what your insurance plan is, use your community, what they are providing for moms and babies to them. Right. Why not? We deserve to. Just empowering moms, empowering women. Yeah. And, you know, and, and um, just to piggyback on uh, what you were saying is part of the empowerment is not me coming to the visit, being the expert to tell the doctor or the nurse what to do, but it is me coming to the visit, learning as much as I can learn about what's possibly going on with me and what my needs are so that I don't have to be in this learning curve that they have to go all the way back to A to teach me about. And if they do, that's okay. That's perfectly okay. But understanding there is so much out there on the internet, you know, YouTube channels that ob are making, you know, look for the sources that you can educate yourself on that are the experts in their field. You know, there are YouTube visits that ob are uh, doing for um, uh, moms in their prenatal and postpartum stage, telling them what to expect, 
telling them how to prepare. There are dietitians and nutrition uh, nutritionists that are doing YouTube videos and telling you what you should be eating during pregnancy, what your baby should be uh, eating and transitioning as they're developing into. Mm -hmm. There are many things depending on your learning style, whether you're, you're just someone that likes to look at videos, that's okay. I'm that person. And I look at videos to see what's out there. I'm also a reader. I read things that doctors and nurses and experts in those fields have said about the things that I need to know about. And so when you're a mom, you don't have to go to college to know what you need. You just know how your body feels and what your body needs. And you look up that information. You even ask questions. Librarians are awesome. Sometimes we have no idea of how to uh, access the, the resources that are right in front of us. The librarian is just not that person that says, it's over there on that shelf or it's on this, you know, film. Ask them questions. Sometimes they're able to give you some direction in understanding that information. Yeah. Ask questions. I tell you when I, I meet people that I am gonna either work with or learn from, I tell them right up front, I am apologizing to you right now because I ask a lot of questions until I get the comfort that I need in understanding that information in order to use it for either me or someone else. And so I tell them up front, I ask a lot of questions. I hope you're ready. Hey, and you know what? That's I want to end on that because I, you know, I every time I talk to you, Joyce, you give me just inspiration. You give me just motivation. I know you're health coach, but it's just who you are too. And I, you know, moms, you're helping so many. And I love that you're teaching the ones who are out there in the field helping. But, you know, the do you mind, do you remember you said something about a box to me the last time we talked about there was you look outside the box or you don't get trapped in the box. And that stuck with me. I'm like, okay, if something's a box, box me in. I'm going to get out of that box. I'm going to break through. And I have, I have learned that there is no box. That's it. There's no the, box. That's exactly what you said. And I was like, you are so right, Joyce. The box that people try to put us in, or even the box that we have grown up in. And oh, we yeah. don't want to leave. We're not comfortable. Yeah. But you have to understand there is no box. Yeah. We have wide open space and land, ocean. And then we have a sky that is endless. So where is the box? There's no there box. There is no box. When you want to expand and evolve and learn, our technology over the last 50 years has grown so fast because of people who said, there is no box. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't be talking to each other you know, uh, on this Zoom call, if there were a box. Yeah, no, you're so right. And, you know, when we, for our listeners, when we go live with this episode, I'm going to make sure I put up all these great notes. We're going to make it an easy, like you said, technology friendly slides on our Instagram, on our Twitter just on our reels, we're on TikTok because you're right. That's where moms are going for information. So we're going to tell them your words of wisdom, how to access their resources. There's no box. Favorite quote of all time. And we're going to have you back. But Joyce, a pleasure. And keep doing what you're doing. And listeners, take it from Joyce. Let's do this. Till next time. Bye, guys. Thanks. Bye.